I should point out that uh, the project that I'm working on is a joint project between the University of Manchester Library, which what used to be called John Ryland's Library, uh, IT services and the IT services. So we're recognising this is a joint piece of work that cannot be done, you know, by one department on its own. Okay, so I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of Manchester for you to understand, you know, the, re the problem we've got. Uh, and how research data management is coming around in Manchester. Um, and then I'm going to give you a sneak preview of our policy that was just ratified on the 16th of May. So it's brand new to press. Okay, so these are some facts and figures from uh, 2010 for Manchester. Um, we've got four faculties, um, engineering, physical sciences, medical and human sciences, um, as well as humanities and life sciences, of which there are 20 schools and hundreds of specialist research groups. Okay, We've got 5,000 plus research staff and 3,500 plus postgraduate students, all of which you know, uh, are doing research, working with data, and it's the, pro it's the wider problem of what we've got to handle. In total, £279.4 million of external research funding was brought in in 2010, uh, which means we have a big responsibility to these guys that are funding us uh, to manage the data. So, research data management in Manchester. Um, prior to any of our projects, we have had an institutional scholarly repository called eScholar for journals and publishing uh, papers, etc., and thesis. Um, in 2009, um, we, actually, we were funded by JISC for a project called MADAM, which is Manchester Data Management. The reason why uh, we went forward with this was um, basically, as uh, Mark referred to, issues in the UK where uh, things like Climate Gate, yeah, uh, Freedom of Information Act, and it, it raised the awareness of institutions of you know the manage the problems in managing research data. Also, uh, funders are changing. Well, the policy updates that Mark referred to as well. EPSRC in particular that Mark referred to have issued that uh, universities should have a path uh, for a fr for developing a framework for research data management uh, later next year, and then something in place by 2015. So they're actually saying you you as an institution should have um, some sort of framework for research data management. So that's uh, what another reason. Okay, ra wasted resources. Um, this is, uh, you've, got re you've got scientists that are actually creating data uh, at instruments, doing their research, keeping it to themselves. Well, really, these instruments that they're using are very expensive, yeah? So it, it, we want to save on on uh, money that way. But also, it's public money, yeah? And that's wasting public money, yeah? And also, you know, as Mark pointed out as well, I've got to mention Mark a lot <laughs> in this, uh, as one of our funders. Um, no, we've got, we've got a responsibility to the public, okay? And also, there's the risk of data loss. So, Madam, our initial project, which was actually working on creating a data management system for just a few users. We didn't try to tackle the whole university at this stage. We were working with the life sciences and uh, medical and human sciences, a couple of groups in each. And we, we, we did a user requirements analysis only to find out what we already kind of knew uh, to a point. And that, that was our data management throughout these groups was ad hoc, inconsistent. You know, it, it was dependent on the user group, how they actually handled their data. Um, multiple copies of data uh, all around the place on laptops, on USB sticks, on external hard drives at home. Wherever you think about it, you know, it was difficult to track down which, which was the right version. You know, after a certain period of time, it was very cloudy. You've got, you know, if, they're not, if it's not managed properly. Yeah? And as mentioned, USB disks, external hard drives, laptops, even um, large servers somewhere. You know, the, it was problem uh, of where the actual data was actually being stored and transferred. So fragmented and decentralized storage, um, which was a nightmare. And of course, you know, just by having your data on an external 
disk drive is not back up, you know, it's not something that you can rely on, yeah. As uh, it was referred to, my background is scientific visualisation. I know how many times, you know, people's hard, external hard drives have been fried, you know, when they've even plugged them into one of our visualisation systems. It's, you know, you just do, you need something that has proper service background um, with regards to backup, etc. Um, and also, because of all this kind of like um, approach by the actual groups to keep things to themselves, it was a limited means of disseminating. Not everybody, and if people were trying to, um, when I started my PhD, <laughs> a little story, I went looking for a really large data set to visualise, yeah? something that would be free on the open market that I'd be able to take and uh, work with. And it is so difficult. I mean, this is 10 years ago. But it was so difficult to actually get somebody to share data with you. Yeah. Why should I have to go out and recreate data if I'm just trying to do an experiment, such as, you know, how do I parallelize um, big data? Anyway, so that's <laughs> a bit of a sidetrack there. So limited means of disseminating. And of course, uh, there was, as well as that, there was no archiving policies uh, to support long term curation or the retention needs of our funders. Okay. Normally, uh, one of the approaches is just to store the data under a desk on a, on a PC or on hard drives. So that is not complying with the funders. So Madam brought about a simple software solution that allowed the researchers to handle their projects, their research data. It linked up with our research office systems. <coughs> yeah? so that um, in the data management planning exercise we cut down the duplication of input of data such as you know who my collaborators are where my data is going to be stored um, you know who who can i share this data with ethics uh, uh, issues you know has it been signed off etc so anything that you could think of data management planning was involved and it also gave us a platform for compliance but this as i said this was only for life sciences and the medical and human sciences and it was this project was funded from 2009 to 2011 um, at which point in two, at the end of 2011 we were lucky to be funded again by JISC on a project called MIS which is Madam into sustainable service uh, and is looking at creating a, a research data management infrastructure service for the University of Manchester in setting about setting up this project, um, we got 250k from JISC to support the project team. But you will notice that the 750k from the main university, most of that, apart from 245,000, which was for storage, was. And, and remember, this is a transition project. It's not the service. Yeah, the service will require a hell of a lot more money for storage and you know, staff input, etc. But the rest of the money that was put towards this project was for staff time. In building up what, to, or working towards a service and research data management infrastructure, we had to involve a lot of people from across the university. Uh, IT services people, in particular storage and infrastructure services, the library, um, the research librarians are uh, going to be helping teaching uh, about research data management. Um, the research uh, support services are the research offices. Yeah, we've got a percentage of time about 27 research business managers to work with the researchers to do their data management planning, etc. So that's just a small example. And of course, there's a steering group, uh, and as well a technical architecture group, which um, are all about delivering the service. Okay, so. One of the main outputs of MIS will be is the, is the policy, and as I said, it was ratified on the 16th of May. And when we started looking at doing this policy, which was really a bit before the project took off, um, we started looking around and thinking, where do we start on writing a policy? We've got the RCUK common principles, which Mark put up, and that is something that you know we thought was really important and would be the, would be a starting point. But as well as that, we've got all the other individual uh, funders policies external to the RCUK councils. We've got European councils, we've got charities, etc. We've also got our own University of Manchester policies. And one thing that you don't want to do in writing a policy is to have 
your policy, the, you know, policies contradicting each other. So an awareness of what is actually happening in your institution uh, is very important, or what policies, and we've got thousands at Manchester. Thank God, uh, part of the money that we did buy in uh, time of the person off was somebody that was a policy maker. Um, the Digital Creation Centre, again in the UK, it's a fantastic uh, point of contact. Uh, for, it has a list of policies yeah, uh, that have already been ratified. In particular, Edinburgh's policy was very useful in, in a point for us to start from. They were, I think, the first in the UK. Yeah. Um, ask, yeah. Uh, well, Kevin, <laughs> they were the first in the UK, weren't they, to... Oh, OK. <laughs> That's why I was very wary of saying that, um, to actually uh, publish a policy. And it was a, it was a good example for a lot of us universities who are actually involved in the JISC research data management. One thing I should advise is that if you are going to have a policy, have an academic champion that's really, you know, good at going out and buying in support for your policy. Um, we had, we, as I said, we started very early on uh, it, before the project, uh, about, say about September, in moving towards the policy last year. The policy has been ratified in May. We didn't expect it to go through that fast. So now we've got another issue on our project in that we've got to have an interim service, you know, that, you know, we are going ahead with. And when you are writing the policy as well, think you want something that's simple and clear for the people to read. You don't want something that's like a political, you know, agenda you you want to make it easy to understand because it's so easy to misinterpret things that are legally you know written in legal terms that is okay so sneak preview okay so in writing the policy what was necessary was clear ownership and responsibilities now mark, mark as i mentioned before talked about the NERC policy and the UPSRC policy and who, who uh, the owner should fall upon for being responsible. What Manchester has taken is a shared approach, okay? So the university will support its researchers, yeah? We will, this, by the way, the, these, the policy, by the way, that I'm showing you is 12 points behind it. It's a lot of pol uh, procedures and guidance that has to be written and is currently being written uh, before we actually make people do things from September. Um, so, you know, we want to make it sound as if, you know, it's not a, a stick. It's a nice, easy place to work in, uh, easy, well, for the researchers. So, okay, so the first point is we adopted the RCUK common principles. And note that as well, we've also said that we will take into account any other research data management requirements. So we're thinking about policies as they from funding bodies as they come about. This policy is not a fixed thing, by the way. It is something that will be reviewed continuously in the movement and uh, the growth of the funding, uh, the, funder po the funders' policies as well. Okay. Um, what we do also say, uh, talk about, is intellectual property rights. So there was a question in the previous talk about who owns the intellectual property rights. At Manchester, uh, our IPR policy says, uh, for staff, the university owns the IPR. Now, PhD students who are paying are a different kettle of fish. And this is where we actually had our first stumbling point and where you have to involve your university lawyers and make sure, um, you know, what you're actually going to put in is the correct wording. And this is where you know, I talk about legal wording uh, being not the way to go, but we, we need to simply put it out that, you know, it, again, if you're a PhD student, uh, less agreed otherwise, you know, uh, you know, you work, you work with the research data management service at the university. And as well as that, PhD students are funded by research councils. And as has been said before in the talks, it's public money. So they have an onus anyway to share their data and to manage their data uh, accordingly. Okay. Um, also, one thing to be very aware of is multi-partner collaboration. 
Okay, so we talked before about data being um, stored in many different places and, you know, ownership of data being a bit muddy. It's very clear for, for us, we said that it was the responsibility of the PI with you in using the data management plan to actually state, you know, any of these details uh, about the research data, who who owns it, or if they don't own it, you know, what you're allowed to do with it, licensing, sharing, etc. So, going on to data management planning, we've said that every research data project, every research project should have a data management plan, uh, which must be maintained throughout the project lifecycle. We see it as a live document. Now. The thing is with data management planning, can be hundreds of questions for a researcher to fill in. So what we're doing as part of the research data management service is integrating the data management planning with working practices. Yeah. And so that's from by working with the research office and the research office systems, we're taking data that's filled in when they're not when a user when a researcher fills in a research application and filling out the data management plan. And again, when they fill in an ethics form, ethics comes, you know, uh, it comes from the ethics system into the data management plan. So it's a, it's a building up of work processes to make the researcher's life easier. Yeah, because what they don't want, and one of the feedbacks, uh, one of the feedback messages from our um, consultation of the policy was, oh gosh, you know, this sounds very bureaucratic, yeah? And do we have to do this, you know? <laughs> so yes, we have to, we have to make it easier for the PI. And again, we've put the responsibility of the PI, uh, of doing the data management plan and the PI. Um, where can data be stored? Um, okay, so we're going to create this service at Manchester, which has some central storage. However, we are very aware that you know research fund research funded by councils such as NERC have their own um, what you call it, repositories. So what we actually say, well, okay, if you've got access to another repository that you have to use because your funder says so, or you you are using because of your community, as long as the, you know you know in our procedures and guidelines it's a recommended and a approved rather approved. Uh, repository, that's fine, just as long as you state where the actual data is in the data management plan. Yeah. And as Mark said, it would be very expensive to hold everything. It's very expensive for universities, especially when funding councils, uh, uh, sorry, charities like the Wellcome Trust says, you have to keep data for 20 years, and that's 20 years from the last time it was actually touched. How can we afford that? How, I mean, one of the concerns of the university is overheads. Yeah. So if you're kind of like thinking of, you know, costing in the retention of data uh, for a 20 year period, and well, you know, you know, our competitiveness goes out the window. Um, so, right, so going back um, onto the policy, the next point seven is about metadata. All, re all relevant data, by the way, notice we've got specific terms because again, what would be good would be a checklist which we could give to our scientists which um, uh, Mark's NERC is looking at um, that tells them what they have to store because one of the que another question that came out of our consultation was what data do I have to store everything or you know can you, you know give us some guidelines that's going to be in our procedures and guidelines anyway we're going to so it's be very interesting to hear more about the actual checklist that Mark was talking referring to um, so yes, we require the researchers to create metadata that describes the data so that, you know, in reuse, people can understand, you know, what this data is, how it could be reused, you know, what variables were applied to the data in producing it, etc. So, and also, this, we see several levels of metadata. It's not just about how the data is created or acquired, but how, how can it be discovered easier and to make reuse uh, relevant. Okay, um, so retention periods, that uh, doesn't need much saying. Um, we've stipulated that, you know, you, the data has to be kept uh, according to the funders guidelines and the University of Manchester guidelines. We have our own guidelines as well, which it's amazing how many people don't actually know, you know researchers don't actually know what their university requires or, uh, them to do, but they know what their funder requires them to do. Uh, openness and publishing, again, it's, you'll notice that a lot of the keywords we're using are the RCUK 
uh, given keywords. So to make data openly available uh, to, to other researchers, but also pr by protecting our, we're protecting our own researchers by saying, of course, you know, you, you, you're going to want to have the impact on your research. So uh, there'll be a limited period of privileged access uh, to ensure that we get uh, the research done that we want to. But also, if data is made openly available to ensure that compliance with uh, ethical approvals, rights of the data subjects, anonymization of data, the 1998 Data Protection Act in the UK, and also all you know the IPR uh, issues, etc., are you know maintained. Um, and also, we protect you know our researchers in the medical human sciences, those that cannot make their research data available yeah but we also protect ourselves as well as an institution saying well maybe you might want to share with some specif spe specified users who you know may need they may be needed for uh, the integrity to uh, to verify the integrity of the research and in doing so you know you must think of the confidentiality um, and also that we realize that published research may only require some of this information so we're kind of like trying to say um, tread carefully yeah. and of course um, we haven't got a stick anymore we did have a stick at point 12 but that was complained about which said you know this could be research you know a case of research misconduct if you don't follow this policy but we've got the softly softly gentle reminder and saying that rem remember we've got a university code of good practice research practice here um, and you know it's an overarching framework for this policy and hint hint that's uh, that means if you don't really you know abide by this policy it is research misconduct yeah. if they read that into it i suppose um so as i said it was ratified on the 16th of may uh, the ratification path was uh, it was quiet uh, quieter than i thought it would be um it went out to several university uh, groups, first of all, the University Research Group and Research Support Group, who were the main guys who kind of like decide upon whether it's a good thing to do and made most of the comments. Um, then it went out to a consultation, uh, out to consultation in March of this year. One thing in ma that I should point out to people in actually sending it out to consultation at such a wide university there's going to be communication path breakdown and you must have some sort of uh, backup plan on how if it does break down um, you know you've still got to keep your your um, path going your your policy going through the system because otherwise if we hadn't have re got to the planning resource committee or the senate or board of governors it'd be next year because the, over the summer it goes really quiet at uk universities and we wouldn't be able to get all these guys together to approve our policy so you have to have backup plan uh, for the communication. Consultation period, as I mentioned, brought up the bureaucracy of it all. And also um, making us aware of, you know, what other, what researchers were actually doing and how difficult this could make it for them. And that is, it's all good, good uh, advice that came through. And uh, we're working with specific uh, users now to ensure that fed back into the consultation period. And that was uh, the main, the main gist of the policy. Yeah, it's still a work, in, it's still a work in practice uh, because we're, we've got to write the procedures and guidance. So it's not public yet, but it should be by September. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.